Hello again, I'm back with a follow-up video on the Stan Onyx Clicker. I was hoping to get this out sooner, but my wife was tagged by a spider and spent four days in the hospital. Not something we thought we'd have to deal with in the northeastern United States. She's okay now, and back home, um, and I can feel like, uh, in light of that, that I can relate a little more to my customers in Australia. Best of luck in the emu wars, mates. I know neither side is officially capitulated, and so it continues. There's going to be a little more vitriol in my material as a result of the events of the last week. I spent that time alone in my empty house redrafting this script and the next one. This was supposed to be for the dialed Arxo site, but I'm going to do this one first and then probably do that tomorrow. Um, but in the process of redrafting those scripts, my mood, which was decidedly foul, has seeped into some of my writing. This is going to be on the more subjective side of things, since I need to talk about how this release performed for me, and that doesn't particularly translate into how it might work for somebody else. I'm also going to be ranting about one of the individuals who may have had some kind of input in the design of the clicker, or more likely Stan went to him and said, hey, look what we made, and you want to try it and promote it? I'll say one thing, the Onyx Clicker has created a lot of discussion on proper shot execution, but if I have to hear or read the words single digit manipulation and shot execution referred to as mental programs that follow neural pathways, I don't know what I'll do with myself. Well, I'll probably do what I'm about to do. I didn't know who Joel Turner was until the Onyx Clicker was announced, but he is apparently well respected as an instructor and shooting coach. This isn't me trying to be, like, too cool for the room. If his is a name I should have encountered previously, well, I missed it. I now know he's Bodie Turner's father, and that's swell. But that's pretty much all I knew. Didn't know anything about Shot IQ or, or anything, uh, anything related to it. Also, I have not and will not purchase his course. I can think of an endless number of things I would sooner do with 200 or $250, however much he's charging for that. So if I'm off the mark or misinterpreting something that is clarified in the paid content, please let me know in the comments. From what I've seen of his interviews, interactions, promo videos, and the ones where people invite him to come out and, and work on, on their form and, and stuff, I find the way he frames the principles of his lessons to be a bit insufferable. In particular, how he claims we are essentially born with target panic, and it stems from our unconscious mind not allowing you to cause your body impact as a surprise. This is a fancy way of saying people either flinch, rush through, or hesitate when things happen around them that they're not used to. I don't know if it's because I grew up around firearms and have spent a measurable percentage of my life at ranges, but anyone who spends a lot of time around loud noises eventually stops reacting to them until something more unexpected happens. Something louder, or, or a different noise, or something closer to you, whatever. The thing is, if you continually expose someone to the thing that's making them flinch or anticipate the shot, eventually they stop flinching or rushing through the shot, or anticipating the shot. If you're doing it to treat a mental disorder, it's called exposure therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. For everybody else, it's just called getting used to what you're doing, and all you need to do that is repetition. Just keep doing the same thing over and over again. It's like the first time you try a firearm that's louder or has more recoil than you're used to, or the first magazine of centerfire ammunition a beginner shoots when he or she graduates up from a 22 or an air gun. The first few shots are going to cause their body to react, and then after a few magazines, it stops or lessen lessens because they know what's coming now. A good way to test this on yourself is if you have someone take a video of you shooting your bow or a firearm and you make sure they focus on your eyes. If you don't blink when the shot goes off, you've effectively disproven the previous statement because you've acclimated yourself to an impact that you've caused. You know, you pull, you're the one that's pulled the trigger, you know it was going to make a loud noise, and you didn't flinch. The trick to it is to do it enough times that you aren't surprised anymore. The technical term is actually sensory adaptation. Like I said, you do something enough time, you're going to stop flinching. In his promo video for Shot IQ, he also claims he's cracked a code that's been plaguing mankind since the advent of the first bow and arrow. He says since shooting began. All I can think of when I hear people say things like that is, what are you trying to sell me here? 
and I don't necessarily disagree with some of the things he teaches other than his assertion that purposeful and intentional movement is the only way to maximize your accuracy. It might work for some, but it's not going to work for everyone because we all have different backgrounds and starting points. Many of us have found or rediscovered archery in adulthood and also engage in different shooting disciplines. I spent the better part of 20 years shooting shotguns, and if you took a picture of me at full draw, you could probably Photoshop out the bow and put a shotgun in my hands. So what works for me isn't going to work for someone who shoots bullseye pistol or three gun or a whole host of other disciplines that may or may not have crossover in terms of, you know, shot execution or the way you anticipate the shot or whether you can even stomach a surprise release. So to me, he seems like he's trying to assert himself as the smartest person in the room by overcomplicating his language so the audience doesn't realize the concepts he's espousing are not all that complicated. It might even be things that they know themselves but haven't really haven't really heard put into words. Things like single-digit manipulation can be simplified to pressing the trigger with whichever finger it lines up with in a controlled and unrushed manner. If I said to someone I'm trying to help with their form that they are experiencing a protective reflex response at the penultimate instance of their shot execution process before release, their next question should rightly be, what the fuck are you talking about? And at that point, I can say, you flinched. And then they should rightly say, why didn't you just say that in the first place? So another thing to think about if you're struggling with target panic or you're having issues with staying on target or being, you know, doing dip bangs or something, um, something to think about that doesn't involve your subconscious trying to sabotage your accuracy is making sure you have your bow set up so you're comfortable using it and not fighting it to stay on target. If you're overbowed, if the bow's too heavy, if you're using too high of a draw weight, if, you're, um, if your draw length is too long, if it's too short, all of those things can make it harder for you to stay on target and, um, and can inadvertently cause you to want to rush through the shot and can exacerbate your target panic. So I figured out before I went to tack that I had my bow shoulder tucked in, in and it was causing me to drop low and constantly fight to hold the bow up and stay on target. And that was making me want to rush through the shot process, especially with a thumb release, because it's a lot easier to, you know, punch a hinge than it is to dump, punch a thumb than it is to dump a hinge. Excuse me. So what I ended up doing was I increased my draw length a tiny bit so I could actually extend my bow shoulder out. And then at that point, you know, miraculously, the pin is just sitting on the target and floating. And I also didn't feel like I needed to rush anything, so no more snap shooting, and I'm far more comfortable standing there with the pin on target. Because ultimately, that's what target panic is. It's an uncomfortability in letting your pin or other aiming device just sit on target without firing the shot. You can just sit there and look at it or let it float, and then do your thing, and then focus on how you're going to, um, how you're going to fire your release or pull your trigger. So making sure your bow is set up for you and that you have the right cues in your head to use it can be just as important as what's going on inside your headspace. The issue with that though is it requires more personalized attention and the tools to make adjustments and that's not something you can sell online. Anyway, let's talk about the release. So I watched the Podium Archery video with Joel Turner talking about how Stan designed the clicker. He keeps saying we and then defers back to saying Stan designed it, so I don't think he had all that much. He may have had some input, but I don't know what it was. Anyway, he says the travel from the click to fire is a little stiffer than the travel to the click. If it is, I can't feel it. The tension feels exactly the same to me from the second I lay my thumb on the barrel to when the sear drops and the hook releases. It's not in any of the materials I've read or seen other than the statement from Joel, so Stan isn't even saying that either. If it was, it would feel more like the two-stage setup I described in my ad nauseum video with my uh, knock to it mini and the antifreeze where I modified the spring to turn it into a two-stage trigger. Uh, this just feels like a single stage trigger that just happens to have a click shortly before it goes off. So in terms of shot execution, if anybody follows Thai Alloy Dragon on Archery Talk, it's me and it's a screen name I've had since high school, you will have read some of this already. 
I run the honest clicker the same as I run my hinges, at least in terms of the method of setting myself up and executing the shot. With my hinges, I draw with my thumb firmly wrapped around my thumb peg, and I don't let go until I'm on target. When I'm floating on target, I let go of the thumb peg, and I relax my hand and pull lightly with my release arm, all the while letting the pin float. When I get to the click, which is usually the fastest available click for the release I'm using, I continue to pull with the same motion and speed as I began until the hook releases. I don't pull to the click, stop, and then start again. It's one continuous motion from start to finish. I shot all the TAC-7 springs courses that way, uphill and downhill shots. It was actually weird uh, for me only using one release at a time. It works for me, your mileage may vary. Also, none of my shots are surprise shots. I know when I'm going to send it, and my mental primary focus is on the manipulation of the release while I stare through the pin and at the target. I'm going to do a video eventually on um, the reasoning behind watching or having your primary vision focused on the pins versus on the target. I focus on the target mainly because if I focus on the pins, as the, if you put focus as the pin floats, it's going to make it look like the target's moving around behind it. Whereas if you stare at the target, it's just going to look like your pin is moving around in front of it. With the clicker, I do basically the same thing. I draw, anchor, and get on target, and I don't touch the thumb barrel until I'm on target. I actually take my thumb and I press it to the nail of my middle finger, and that creates a closed loop that I can pull against. And that's actually useful for, one, it gives my thumb something to do instead of floating in space. Um, but it also uh, creates a closed loop so you can pull against, and then it, it doesn't, you don't wear out the muscles in your forearm as quickly. So anyway... When I'm comfortably floating on target, I get my thumb on the thumb barrel and I start to press down slowly, though I've learned it's actually important to pay attention to how you're pressing, and I'll talk about that shortly. I continue to press down slowly through the click until the release fires. Once again, it's all one continuous movement of my thumb from start of the press all the way down to fire. I don't, you know, pull, get to the click, and then start over with a different motion. There's no stutter step in there for me. It's just one consistent pull. I don't know if this is a me issue or if anyone else has this issue or I just discovered something that somebody else probably did at some point. I try to figure things out for myself first before seeking out guidance, and I will n never pay for lessons. But one thing I noticed trying to exclusively use my thumb to pull the trigger on the Onyx C, as opposed to either pulling through the shot, squeezing my hand, which is apparently what I was doing before, or doing a combination of both, is I needed to adjust what I was doing with my thumb and spend more time fine-tuning where the thumb barrel is positioned. When I shoot a thumb with a pull-through or a squeeze method, it doesn't seem to be as critical to fine-tune the thumb barrel, um, and it makes more sense to use a larger thumb barrel to intentionally feel like your thumb anchor is less precise. The clicker will work fine with whatever method of shot execution you use, choose to use, uh, but I'm not nearly as consistent with either the squeeze or the pull-through, at least with a thumb release. So I'm going to stick with, uh, or I'm going to continue to try to develop the uh, thumb curl method that I just discovered for myself, even though somebody else probably already knows about it. So more on that in a minute. So sitting here playing with the release at my desk is not the same as when I'm under tension at full draw with my hand flattened out and anchored. Duh, it should be obvious. The angle of my thumb and the direction my thumb moves when I get to full draw flattened out, it changes in relation to how the trigger pivots. If I set it to lay on the pad of my thumb like so, or set the barrel so it sits at the base of my thumb, when I flatten out my hand at full draw, it feels more natural, or I was finding it to be more natural to try to press straight down on it like I'm pressing down on a plunger. So I ended up pressing this way with my thumb when I needed to be pressing that way. So I ended up needing to set up the thumb barrel to sit in a spot where my thumb was capable of moving in the direction the trigger needs to travel. Thumb release triggers are mostly designed to pivot down and back, and some of them require more rearward movement than others. Carter releases mostly allow you to pull straight down. Stand releases require more uh, downward and rearward movement because they pivot this way, and releases like the Apex Surge like this one, actually require you to pull 
backwards a lot more than downwards. If you try to push downwards on this, it ain't going to move. So if you push um, straight down into the back of the release, in the case of the Onyx clicker, it's not going to move as easily and you'll feel like it's taking forever to get it to go off despite the tension being set fairly light. So now that I realize that, what I started doing instead of laying my thumb on the barrel and using the second knuckle and the basal joint to press down, the basal joint is the one that attaches your thumb down to your wrist and gives your thumb its uh, dexterity, I started initiating the movement with the first knuckle, so the one that bends up here, and curling my thumb around the thumb barrel and continuing the motion of curling my thumb until I pull through the click and release the hook. This gave me a much more controlled, methodical cue for setting it off. Just slowly uh, curl your thumb around towards your palm. So far, for me, this was the most consistent way I've found of shooting this release, and I'm fairly certain it'll actually translate over into other thumbs. So in order to better facilitate this movement, I ended up going to... I was using a large thumb barrel with a with a short post i ended up going to the small thumb barrel and the longer post so i have a more defined anchor point for my thumb and right now i have it set up so it sits right in the crease uh, of my first joint i also shortened the pre-travel to the click since it was taking me way too long to get to the click um, i set it so i initially ended up winding down the travel until it was really close to the click so like right after i was getting onto it and starting to pull it would click and then i started to get punchy so i backed it off a little bit so this is how i have it set up right now so a little bit of movement um you don't really need it it's going to depend on how much you want to have to move i think the people who are okay with pulling to the click purposely and then starting their shot process will do better with more travel but for me just enough to not be on the click was enough um, was enough for me. So, like I said, set it so it was very close to the click, and then I added more travel back when I got too close to the click and started to get punchy. Tension-wise, I have it set pretty light. I haven't tried playing with it or making it stiffer to get a little more feedback, um, but I'm probably going to do that because I almost can't feel it move when I'm at full draw. You can feel it now, but like I said, when you have your body under tension... When you're at full draw, holding against the uh, holding against your draw stops, it's a little harder to sense the fine motor movements that you're uh, performing. I think having a little more tension, if you're gonna set it up, I think start light and then see how much you need to add to it in order to be able to feel it, just to get a little bit of pushback, so you can um, so you can get the necessary feedback you need to know that you're moving it or that the thing is moving or the trigger is moving and you're moving it towards the uh, the click. I shot it at 60 yards last night and my group actually wasn't in the bullseye, but it was, it was actually pretty tight. It was a four arrow group in about a six inch circle and there's definitely something to it. Um, it's pretty easy to be consistent in terms of um, in terms of that. Like I said, as long as you have a cue, the right cues. Like I finally developed a cue that works, and that's the just get your thumb barrel, uh, get your thumb around the thumb barrel, and then just just curl your thumb, and um, and that's the the kind of cue that I needed in order to be pretty consistent. Um, so overall, I'm really pleased with the Onyx Clicker, and I'm going to continue to fiddle around with it. Um, and if I have any other revelations about it, I'll definitely get back on and share it. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, please let me know in the comments. And if there's any other, if there's anything you think I may have missed, or anything I didn't get in the first, the first video or this one, you know, please feel free to um, to ask, and I will answer your comments as soon as I can. Uh, take care, stay safe, and happy hunting. If you don't blink when the shot goes off, you've effectively disproven the previous statement because you've a I knew I was going to have trouble with that.